So what I'd like to do is take a little bit of time with you and just talk about uh, community partnerships, community research partnerships. Some of you may be involved in partnerships now. Some of you may be thinking, I want to be involved in partnerships. How do I do it? How do I make it work? Um, some of you may be thinking that this is something that I'm not sure if it can really work, but I'd like to know more about it. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some of the kinds of things and experiences that we have had uh, and invite you to come along on the ride. So the uh, goals for today's discussion um, are to to talk about partnerships, uh, but to talk about some of the interesting challenges that need your talent to solve them. So because uh, this kind of research isn't done as often as some other kinds of research, we still have some problems we need to work out and we need people like you to help make that happen. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of those challenges and some of the questions that those raise um, and suggest a few ways that we might be able to um, evaluate the effectiveness of what we're doing so that we can say at the end, you know, it's worth the time and bother. bother. This really does help. And then invite you to come along and, and be a part of this, this process of helping us do, do a good job. So I want to start out with a few stories uh, just to get us thinking about some of the issues. And the first one, one that a lot of us are hearing a great deal about, is pediatric asthma and that it's becoming more common and it's, it's very much a worry. In Lowell, for example, it accounts for more lost school days on the part of school children than any other illness. So it's really a serious problem. A group of people in Lowell came together and said, this is especially a problem. We're seeing it especially among children from the Southeast Asian community. And we have the answer. What we're going to do is we're going to get bed covers. And we're going to give bed covers to everybody in the community so that that will take care of the fact that there are mites on their beds and that may be exacerbating their, um, their pediatric asthma. The asthma is there. So everybody, they're all feeling really good. We got a donation. We got these took them out to the community, and community people said, in our community, kids don't sleep on that size bed. These are of no use to us. So everybody's feeling good and thought, this is going to work, but didn't work. Um, private wells. I'm now at University of Maine, and Maine leads the country in the number of households that are on private wells. It also leads the country in the number of households that are in private wells that have arsenic. Uh, and so a group of faculty got together and they said, we have an answer. What we'll do is we'll devote some time to really putting together a way to test those private wells. And then we'll tell people that they have arsenic in their well water. And so that's what they did. In Maine, there, there are no resources. If you find arsenic in your well water, there isn't anything to help you deal with that. So here you have people. Their primary asset is their land and their home, and they've just been told that their drinking water is a problem. Didn't work. Didn't work. It was done without a partnership, and it didn't work. People thought, I don't want to know. One, I went to some of the meetings. One person said, I'm not so worried about my family. I'm really worried about my dog, because uh, my dog really drinks a lot of water. I don't know quite what to do. Um, Merrimack River. It's the river that runs through Lowell beautiful historic river. It's a river that used to change color depending on what the mills were dying. Um, people moved to Lowell, they want to fish there. EPA says, we don't want people fishing there. That river is not a fishable river. Let's put up signs. We'll just tell people that they shouldn't fish and they'll stop fishing. So they put up signs and it didn't work. Um, homes and lead, you probably know a lot about homes and lead. Lawrence, Massachusetts, another nearby city um, that I hope someday you'll get a chance to visit in, in Massachusetts. It is within driving distance of all the major research universities. It's the most Latino community on the East Coast, north of Miami. Um, and so when people want to do research, all the different research universities like Harvard and MIT and BU, 
they drive up to Lawrence and say, we want to do research on you. And the people in Lawrence developed a mayor's health task force to say, we need this research, but we don't need these researchers. This is really a problem. So those examples are examples of things that all of us end up doing where we've got this interesting problem. People who have research skills and communities that may be able to benefit from a partnership, but we don't have experience often as faculty in terms of how to make those things come together in a way that's really helpful. So what's going on, not just in Massachusetts, not just in Wisconsin, but all over the world, is people are really moving towards doing more and more community partnership research. Um, I just had the good fortune of uh, co-editing a, a volume of a journal that was on international perspectives on community university partnerships. And there were people from all these different uh, countries who wrote about their experience, what they're doing, the struggles that they have. It's going on all over. It's, it's the cod fishers in Maine are doing community partnerships, trying to figure out what's happening, what, why is there the collapse of the cod um, fishery. Uh, there are people doing, doing the work um, in China, looking at uh, why farmers are, um, on the, this is what the researchers said, why the farmers are resistant to using better farming practices. And so they're starting to th try to think about community partnerships differently, environmental health. And it's, if you Googled community, research partnerships, you wouldn't see much of what's going on because it's happening under all these different names. In Europe, you'd see science shops. Um, in um, South America, you might see action research. Uh, in the sustainability field, people are talking more and more about co-production of knowledge. In health fields, community-based participatory research um, and stakeholder researcher partnerships. And these different pockets of work, they're not talking to each other. We're not getting a chance to learn from each other um, because we're publishing in different places. We're going to different conferences. We're not friends with each other. And so the question is, how can we learn from each other to do interesting work? So as people have started to do community research partnerships, there's some puzzles um, that people all over are trying to solve. Um, and one of the kinds of puzzles they're trying to solve is how do we do research that matters? Certainly we want it to end up in journals, and all of you someday, if you go on to graduate school, you know, you'll publish in journals, but we want it not just to sit on the shelf. If we've got pediatric asthma, we want that rate to go down. If we have arsenic in the well water, we don't want to be able to say there's arsenic in the well water. We want to do something so it's not affecting people's lives. So how to design research that matters? Um, how to avoid losing the richness of the activity. So one of the things that, that we're pretty good at doing when we do research is simplifying things, figuring out how to make it simple so we can study it. That's often good to do, but sometimes it loses the very essence of what it is we're trying to understand. So how do we keep that richness? How do we link knowledge to action? So if I find out something about smoking and I tell my mom about it, um, and she says, oh, that's nice, you're doing interesting work. That doesn't do very much. How do we take that knowledge and make sure it leads to action, that it makes a difference? Um, people are trying to figure out what's called the loading dock problem. Um, a researcher by the name of David Cash has used this term, and he said, you know what we're doing with research now? It's just like we're in an industrial plant. And what we're doing is we create a widget. We create something. We've got a manufacturing plant. We do that. We take it. We make it. We carry it out. And we put it on the loading dock. And we assume somebody's going to be there to pick it up, buy it, and use it. Well, when we do research, we're kind of doing the same thing. We say, somebody must be interested in this. We've found an interesting problem. So we're going to study it and do it. And then we're going to take the results and do the equivalent of putting it on a loading dock and assume there's somebody there who's going to pick it up and use it. And so there are all kinds of people trying to figure out how do we move away from that loading dock mentality. Um, and there's another interesting whole body of work on wicked problems um, and trying to understand why it is that it doesn't work just to have technical information. And that a lot of problems we can do the research, 
but the research won't do enough because um, it, there, there are a lot of different policy issues there, there are a variety of views on things, and there's also what's lacking is what's called a stopping rule. Um, that with what are, what are the, these complex problems, um, they're described as things that we're not sure when we know enough to do something about it. And, and those have been termed wicked problems. People are getting interested in um, engaged partnerships because of the issues of power and fairness. So who gets to decide what's done and how do they decide it? Um, and also all kinds of interesting things like how do you sustain success? So if you find that you've set up a program where people do a lot of walking, how do you keep it going? Um, and increasingly people are saying a lot of partnerships started in urban areas where people have FaceTime with each other. Now what do we do if we want the entire state of Wisconsin to be a part of a partnership? And people don't, they're not able to look each other in the eye. How do we keep it going? How do we make it happen? So those are some of the problems that people are trying to think about. And there are reasons why those problems matter. And these are just some examples of why they matter in Lowell, where I've done a fair amount of my work. On the right here is, uh, um, uh, this is from our Cambodian Community Health 2010 program and describes some of what we're doing, but I just want you to see that image. Um, if we just do research without thinking about how it's going to make a difference, there are things that we're not dealing with. In Lowell, there are a lot of people living in lead contaminated houses because we have really old houses there. Um, we have Cambodian moms who increasingly own their own home daycare centers and they need to understand environmental health. We have Cambodian children with asthma. We have a lot of people, as I said, who are fishing in the Merrimack River. If we don't figure out how to have partnerships that help solve these problems in ways that work for the community and that get sustained, then the research is great but it's not making a difference that it could make. And so the question is, how, how do we have that happen? How do we solve some of these puzzles? Um, in Maine, we're trying to solve these puzzles too because we've got a project that's called the Sustainability Solutions Initiative. Um, very different from Lowell. It involves the entire state of Maine, 100 faculty, every higher ed institution, all kinds of different problems, all thinking about what kinds of sustainability issues do we have with our water in Maine, with our land, um, uh, with climate change? What are all these different issues that are, that are coming? Um, and how do we take people from a bunch of different disciplines, we have something like 12 different disciplines, all trying to work together, looking at, say, degradation of lakes where people want to fish and, and have their summer homes. And how do we think about that? What do we do about that? And we want to not just study the problem, but actually enter into partnerships with the stakeholders. And to do that, we've got to solve the puzzle of, do the stakeholders want to work with us? Are they interested in being a part of what researchers are doing? Um, and how do we do that, given that there are 36 different projects going on, how do we do this in a way that we avoid orthodoxy, that we don't say, okay, the thing that we're doing with Belgrade Lakes is the same thing that we should be doing with coastal communities, is the same thing that we should be doing in Portland, Maine, is the same thing we should be doing with, with small woodlot owners. How do we avoid that orthodoxy in terms of developing uh, nimble, resilient partnerships? And so what we're increasingly saying is how do we develop those partnerships and how do we evaluate if they work, if, if, if they have quality, if they make a difference? And one of the things that's, that we're finding that's really important to think about is when people ask the question, is this a good partnership? They often do it, we all do it in kind of a simple-minded way, and we need to recognize that there are a bunch of different things we could be thinking about when we think about partnerships and evaluating them. Quality of the research, do we get high-level, rigorous research coming out of, of this, this approach. Is the research useful? Does it, does it make a difference? If we have indicators of usefulness, do we find that people report it to be more useful? The speed with which the knowledge is linked to action, could we evaluate that? So do we find that if we do the research in partnership 
So let's say that what we're interested in is doing some work on tidal power, which is one of the things we're doing in, in Maine and in partnership. Does, if we do it in partnership, do the findings that come out of that work, looking at whether fish are harmed by tidal power, is that research more likely to get used if it's done and developed in partnership than if it's developed just by the researchers? Um, can we evaluate it in terms of the contribution that it makes to the literature? And is the contribution equal to or better than if the research is done just by people, say, on a campus, deciding for themselves what the issues are? Um, and can we think about the ethics of the research? Is it perhaps um, more ethical if it's done in partnership in developing uh, the issues? Oh, let me say who this. We have a research team of high school students who work with us on these projects, and that's the team right there. It's the River Ambassadors, um, and they have all kinds of interesting things to say about what's fun about working with researchers and what really doesn't work in terms of working with researchers. Um, and they've just, they wrote an article recently about what researchers need to know about teens if they actually want to do re have them involved as research partners. There will be a test on this. No, I'm just, I'm just seeing if you're listening. Um, when we think about partnerships, there are some people who have gone ahead of us a bit, and they said, well, can we identify some rules that should be followed? And so another way that we could decide we're going to see if we've got good partnerships is we could say, do they meet these, these kind of rules, for example, that an important group, the Community Campus Partnerships for Health, has developed? So we could use those and compare what we're doing against those and say, okay, this is a, a road map. Can we follow these? Is this helpful? So, Kind of what we need to think about when we're doing partnerships is some tools for thinking about how do we develop them, how do we know if they're working well, um, how do we do problem solving. So rather than saying, if you do it this way, then that's absolutely the right way, and if I do it this way, this is the wrong way. How do we keep thinking about this as an area for innovation in terms of, um, of problem solving? So I want to give you just a couple of examples of things to think about. And the first is, I don't expect that you're going to read all this, but the first is we were thinking a lot um, about uh, community uh, research partnerships and, say, trying to do things like looking at pediatric asthma or looking at something like childhood obesity and what do we do about it. Um, and when you talk to people who are thinking about being in partnerships or have been in research partnerships, They'll, they'll often make these really global statements like, well, um, partnerships don't work because um, in, in the end, the, the researchers um, kind of control the process. Or partnerships don't work because um, somebody decides at the beginning what we're going to study and it could be the wrong thing that's studied. Doesn't it sound like we're having an earthquake here? <laughs> um, and so what we started thinking about is, rather than simplifying our understanding of partnerships, probably what we ought to do is come up with an idea, a tool that helps us think about partnerships at beginning, middle, and end stages, and recognize that it's kind of a cycle. So it doesn't just end, it continues. Just, just as an aside, when we started some of these projects with our Cambodian colleagues, and I put a usual timeline together that had January here, in December here, um, uh, and one of my colleagues said, Linda, you make it look like the world ends at the end of December. Why not do a, a circle in terms of capturing what we're trying to do that we keep continuing? So we started doing that in a lot of the work that we did. And in the research partnership, we used started to develop this kind of model where we said, let's think about when we're doing partnerships, what are the challenges that come up at the initial stages? that we need to think about. What are some of the challenges that come up at the middle stages? What are some of the challenges that come up at the end stages? And how can we do problem solving to think about any of, any of those? So um, one of the examples, like at the beginning, is which 
which problem are you going to focus on? Are you going to focus on lead? Are you going to focus on obesity? Are you going to um, focus on crime in communities? And who gets to decide? So that's an issue in research partnerships that comes up at the very beginning. Near the end, one of the issues that can come up is, what if the results reflect badly on the community? Uh, and so we developed a course that's all about having people think about uh, and identify what are they seeing in their partnerships of the issues that come up at the beginning and at the middle and at the end, um, and how do these differ for different kinds of problems and different kinds of partnerships, um, and how could we solve these. And we use this not to come up with answers necessarily, but to identify and systematize our understanding of the problems, and then to keep going back and saying, oh, now we've seen a new interesting way to strategize about this thing. Oh, we've seen this. Like, near the beginning of a partnership, one of the issues that can come up is who gets to decide how you'll study the problem? Um, is this just in the domain of the researcher, or does the community and the researcher come together in terms of deciding that? How do you decide it? So this is a tool that we have used to think about some of these issues. Um, for example, this is a, a partnership. If you, if you don't read Kamai, and I don't read Kamai, um, struggle to read this, but this is a, a, for HIV and AIDS um, a research action partnership we had in Lowell with uh, diverse teens. And um, this is an example of a place where we said, OK, let's think about what we need to do at the beginning. And then let's look at the mistakes that we made and, and, and think about what are some strategies that would help as we go along, um, and what kinds of things are coming up at the middle, and what's coming up at the end. For example, one of the issues that comes up at the end is who owns the data? Do the data belong to the community? Do the data belong to the researchers? Do they belong to both jointly? Um, who gets to decide? When you're thinking about implementing a strategy, how are those decisions made? Uh, and so it was really helpful for us to have this kind of model, a tool that helps us think about the issues. Here's another tool. You're saying, what does this have to do with anything? This is one of the things that's interesting in partnerships is that one of the things you sometimes hear people saying is, well, if we're partners, we're lockstep. We're going through this together. The community and the researchers, we're doing everything together. But it turns out that that may or may not be what the people in the partnership want, what the researchers want, and what the community wants. And so this is um, a tool that was uh, developed and we modified uh, by a group that wrote a book called Swimming Upstream, um, looking at environmental issues. And if we look at this table for just a second, what it tells us is we can kind of think on the left, on that first column, is that there are different types of partnerships. Um, one kind of partnership is where you say the university is going to be the lead partner. And what that would mean is if you look across the row, it says the researchers are going to do the problem identification. They're going to say, gee, the problem we need to study is, is pediatric asthma or the problem we need to study in our community is racism. They're the ones that are going to do the research. They're the ones that are, that are going to propose the solution that comes out of the research. Um, and uh, the, in this case, we're working with municipal officials. And the, the community partners, the municipal officials, they'd be responsible for the implementation. So that's one kind of partnership. If you go down to the very bottom, university is full partner. It's saying that every step along the way, the two groups are going to work together. And it turns out that you can, you can do surveys and you can ask the different partners to the party what they prefer. We did this with every city and town in Maine municipal officials, and with university faculty. Did they agree? So the university as lead 
partner was quite, quite appealing to the researchers. Um, they assumed that the community people might see university as full partner along all, all the way would be really interesting to the community. No. Um, the, the communities across Maine pretty, pretty consistently were very interested in um, working together with the researchers on problem identification. They didn't want to do the research. They wanted the faculty to go do it. They wanted the faculty sometimes to be involved in helping think about solutions, but they didn't want the faculty involved in actually implementing them. So the goal isn't to have you remember all of this. The goal is to say this is an interesting tool because it helps us say, okay, let's not just assume that we're doing all of this together, holding hands, going through it all, but that, that we need to do some problem solving and think about this in a pretty nuanced way and that there are a lot of different possibilities for partnerships. Um, this is just showing you where, how many dots there are, all these different little cities and towns in Maine. And one of the things that we've been trying to do is figure out how do we work with all of them? How do we build partnerships with them all? How do we think about uh, all of these kinds of issues? How do we do this um, across these uh, large distances, these, these very significant distances? Um, and as we've been thinking about these things, again, we go back to the issues that I raised earlier that I hope that you'll do a lot of thinking about is if we're going to build these partnerships, and this is a picture of one of the events as part of one of our partnerships, is how are we going to decide that what we're doing works? Are we going to focus on whether the knowledge leads to action? Are we going to focus on the strength of the partnership? So do we stay together, or is maybe that not so important? What's important is we come together for a little while, we solve a problem, and then we all move on. So is it strength of the partnership? Is it the quality of the research? Is it the ethics of the research? Is it the ways that richness, complexity of activity of the partnership, that that's not lost? Is it avoidance of the loading dock problem? So rather than assume, that we know kind of what we're looking at when we're thinking about what works. There are a lot of different things that we can look at. Um, let me give you another example of a partnership that, again, helps us say, gee, we've got to think about this in a lot of different ways. So in Maine, and you've got this in Wisconsin, got a problem with the emerald ash borer coming in, really doing in the, the ash trees. In Maine, a lot of foresters don't care, doesn't matter, because that's not a big, um, they don't take down the ash trees um, uh, to use them uh, in, a, in a lot of the manufacturing. It really, really matters to the Wabanaki community because the baskets are made from the ash trees. And so one of the things that's been really important as a part of the Sustainability Solutions Initiative is to figure out how to build a research partnership that brings together the researchers who study emerald ash borer with the basket makers to think about how do you prepare for the emerald ash borer coming into Maine? What's going to work? What would be effective? What kind of research is needed? How can this knowledge lead to action? Is the action to cut down the trees? Is the action to do, use pesticides? What's the action? And what would be viable? What would be useful? This is just a listing of a, some of the different um, community university research partnerships that we've done in Lowell to try to think about how do we bring researchers and community together. And one of the things that we discovered across these different things, like a cable television show that the teens did, like the water festival, like a youth research project, like the listening project where we listen to families talk about what it feels like to have a child with asthma. Um, the um, uh, celebrating diverse uh, traditions of community preservation and looking at healthy homes, looking at home contaminants. In all these cases, one of the things that we discovered is it doesn't work to start with the research. It doesn't work, even though I love research, it doesn't work to just come in and say, we're going to do the research, we know this is important and you're going to like what we find, it's going to be helpful. That we really did a lot of 
building partnerships around common interests, trying to figure out what are the, what are the worries, what are the concerns people had um, that, that are really important in terms of the water festival, really discovering that all kinds of different environmental problems are awful in Lowell. But what people had in common was worrying about water. So how could we use water? This is a picture from the Southeast Asian Water Festival. How could we use water as a way to celebrate tradition, also to think about research that we could do together that could then come back and be reported at the water festival that the first year there were 5,000 people at. Now it's annual. It's in about its 12th year. And about 50,000 people come from all over the country. And it still has that research piece there as well as the, the community action piece. So how do we do the research? How do we build the partnership that has research there, but also has pieces there that will help the knowledge lead to action? Don't even try and read this. This is an example, again, building on the same theme. We knew that people shouldn't necessarily be eating the fish out of the river. But fishing is one of the most important activities in Lowell that people do with their families. So is there something that we could do that would help us focus on the contaminants in fish, the heavy metals, but at the same time celebrate fish and bring people together as opposed to separating them? And so we had graduate students who worked with us who went to all the different communities in Lowell and ask people about their favorite fish recipe. What fish recipes had been passed down in their families? Uh, people who were from Dominican Republic, people who were from Greece, people who were from Italy. What had been passed down? And we discovered all these commonalities in terms of interest in fish and used that then to talk about what do we do to make it safe to eat the fish out of the river? How do we begin to think about these issues? But we used this together with then the EPA warnings as a way to build the partnership to do the research. We also want to think, we found we need to think really broadly about tools that will help us have good research partnerships, partnerships that make a difference. And I wanted to give you one example of that. Um, and some of you have heard this, but this is there's a, a terrific community research activist in South Central Los Angeles. And one of the things that she has said in terms of partnerships is we need to use metaphors. We need to use, instead of just talking in flat ways, we need to use some things that help us connect what we're talking about in terms of research with other things in our lives so that we can all come together. And she uses a bus metaphor. So she says, OK, so let's say that we decide that we're going to do some research together, that we're really interested in community gardening. And we want to see if, if uh, we, we want to look at you know, whether people are eating, eating food that's good for them and whether they're growing it. We're going to do a lot of different things. She said that one of the things that happens a lot of times when you bring together researchers on something with communities is it's like we get on a bus together, but there's a problem. And the problem is, who's driving the bus? Are the researchers driving the bus? Or is the community driving the bus? Or is there some way that you can share the driving? What route will the bus take? So you have a plan for where it's going to go. Um, what do you do about the fact that people get on and off the bus at different times? So you start your partnership. And then some new researchers come in, and they don't know what went on before. Or some community people were there at the beginning, and then they're not there at the end. Sort of, what do you do? How do you, how do you deal with the fact that people are, are getting on and off at a different time? And what's the destination of the bus? So she said, in terms of a lot of the environmental work that was going on, the environmental research work that was going on in Los Angeles, for the researchers, the destination of the bus was a publication. And for the community, the destination of the bus was the improvement of their children's health. Uh, and if there's not a way that you're thinking together um, in terms of what's going on, you're on the bus, but you're not going to the same place. And how do you use things like thinking about a bus or some other um, concept, some other idea that helps you have these conversations about what you're trying to do and where you're trying to go? And so how can we? use things like metaphors as tools in, in research partnerships? Um, how can we use them to um, evaluate the effectiveness? 
in, in, in Lowell, when we were doing various kinds of things and we wouldn't understand each other, we started using um, sort of mental pictures to help each other. Like there was a point at which we were trying to figure out what do we do as a community for isolated elders who had moved from Southeast Asia and they felt like they had lost everything. And people were living in Lowell, you know, we just didn't get it. We didn't get, you know, what our colleagues were saying. And so finally, um, uh, one of my colleagues said, listen, this is what it's like. You know the streams in Lowell and the big trees by the streams and then we have a flood? Well, our elders are like those big stately trees. And there's been a flood. The flood is like when they've moved to the U.S. And they fall over because they've lost their roots. They've lost the things that held them in place. So how do we make them stately again? And that, using that example helped us start to have the dialogue about what we needed to do, what kind of information we needed, what kind of research that would help lead to action that would make a difference for the families. And it was getting out of our using technical information, using things like metaphors, that really helped us move forward in terms of these partnerships. So, what am I saying? Who knows? I hope you know. Um, what I'm saying is that, that one of the things that I think is most exciting for all of us now is the opportunity to do research that makes a difference to do research that, yes, your academic colleagues understand and say is, is top notch, but that people in the community come up to you and say, here's how we're going to use that information. And it's hard. That often doesn't happen. There are a lot of frustrations. But when it happens, you feel like, wow, that's important. That research is going to make a difference. Um, and that's not going to happen by coming up with a set of real rules in terms of how to do part of uh, community engaged research. We're not really at that stage yet that one rule will fit all kinds of partnerships. What we need to do and what we need you to do is to get involved in partnerships, lots of different kinds of partnerships, and then do problem solving. Say, oh, I thought this would work. I tried this, didn't work, and to keep Keep problem solving. Keep trying things. See what, what works in one case and what um, works in another case and how they differ. Um, if it's different kinds of communities, if it's different kinds of researchers, if it's different kinds of problems. Um, keep problem solving. Keep thinking about it and talking with people so that we can start to have emerging ideas, but not too quickly getting kind of ossified and saying, okay, this is exactly what we should do. These are the rules that we should follow. Look for opportunities to innovate. Community university research partnerships are a wonderful place right now for you to be creative, to try different things with your partners, to do different kinds of things, um, and to make mistakes. They're a wonderful place to say, we, have, we don't have it all figured out. And you get to help do that. It's as if we said, cars don't exist yet, but we need some kind of form of transportation. Help us figure out something that is going to get us one place to another, but doesn't pollute, uh, but doesn't need a lot of infrastructure, um, but solves these other problems of helping us get all the way from uh, Wisconsin um, to the great state of Maine so you can see the kinds of things that we're doing. So we need you to be thinking about this, to try things out, to solve problems. And what's also really important is to try to avoid orthodoxy. So try to avoid saying, these are the best practices. This is exactly what you should do. This is how you should do it. Um, and if this works in Maine, then it's going to work in Massachusetts, then it's going to work in Iowa, then it's going to work in California. We need to have things that are going to work in all those different places but we really need to think in nuanced ways about if it's a partnership that involves a community of 100, do we do the same thing in Milwaukee? 
So, and how do we think about those issues? How do we solve those, pos those, those puzzles and think about them in creative ways? If we have a partnership that has, that's biologists, um, is it the same kind of partnership as if we have people from family medicine? How do we think about that? How do we solve some of those kinds of, of problems and issues? Um, Look for ways to build on each other's experiences without making the fit too tight. So if you have a really great partnership that you do, then how do I learn from you without you telling me this is exactly what you need to do and you need to do it like this? But yet have you tell me, here's what seemed to work. Let's think about whether your situation is similar to or different from my situation. So how do we learn from each other, but not overlearn, not overscript things, so that we get, we kind of try to do this all in, in, um, in too fixed a pattern. And draw the best from best practice approach without losing the context. So there's a lot of writing now about coming up with best practices. So you might talk about classroom. What's the best practices for K-12 uh, classrooms? What's the best practices uh, for um, uh, the national park to do da-da-da? There's a great idea behind best practices. It's that it's how do we uh, summarize our experience? The problem with a lot of the best practice literature is it forgets about context. That the best practice, the thing that works in northern Maine may be very different than what works in southern Texas. Um, one of the big studies we did recently was on road salt and how much the, the um, little cities and towns in Maine are spending on road salt. When I was talking to some people at, at University of Houston about that as being really important, they just laughed. They said, what are you talking about? That's not important. So how do we recognize differences and learn from each other when the context is different and really pay attention to that? And ultimately, one of the things that we really need to do is welcome researchers who are really insistent that community-engaged research, that partnership research doesn't work. We need each other. We need people who have a lot of different kinds of skills to get involved. And they may not have had the opportunity to learn about community-based participatory research. They may not believe that it works. Um, they may be difficult people. They may be jerks. And we think we don't know if we want them out in the community. But we need to find ways to really have a big tent to bring people in. Um, they may be people that are helpful, but they haven't yet realized how that's the case. And so our interesting problem is to figure out how to involve and invite all of our colleagues and our students to be a part of this work, to, to really help us think about it and do things. And finally, to think about some take-home messages. So how do we strengthen the, these kinds of partnerships? How do we make it happen? One of the things I invite you to, to do is to look at, there's a, um, the graduate course I taught in the fall at UMaine was on stakeholder researcher partnerships. And with each course I do, the students have to develop something that's giving, giving back, that's really building partnership. And so they developed a webinar with a number of the, of the um, community partners that we work with. And if you go to that uh, website, a number of the resources that they put together are there. Um, and it, it was really a really neat, interesting uh, uh, project they did. I, I didn't know what a webinar was, and now we've done one. So it was, it was exciting. Um, and I also, there's my contact um, information. And I would love to have you, you know, send me a note and say, Here's how I agree with what you said, or here's how I think you're completely out to lunch, or here's a question that I have, and that you should really feel free to, um, to, to send me questions or thoughts or comments. So I've tried to leave a little bit of time to hear from you, now that I've yammered at you for a while. Um, I, I think I came to doing community-engaged research after being a basic researcher for a lot of years, um, and this was not something that I was trained to do, and I made a lot of mistakes. Um, and um, what's been interesting is the research that I've done is community-engaged research has had much more impact 
than uh, the books I've written and the journal articles um, that I've done that I thought were, you know, people told me were top notch. Um, I don't know that if anybody understood them. I'm not sure even I understood them. But it's, it's an interesting time for us as researchers to think about how do we make a difference with this wonderful asset we have of having research skills um, and being able to work with communities.